Our next panel is nothing short of phenomenal. To introduce our panelists, um, actually, I'm going to introduce them instead. But chairing this panel is the non-executive director of Australia Post, Deirdre Wilmot, and joining her, Taj Fabari, Nigel Amphalor, and Guy Herbert. Where do you want to sit? You're going to sit there? So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the introductions and also to our outstanding panel today. And uh, we're going to be talking about AI, machine learning, automation, and the extent to which they're taking over some of the tasks currently performed by people. And we're going to be looking at uh, some of the opportunities and challenges that that will provide for corporations and, and the people who work uh, in those organisations. As an example, uh, Australia Post, where I'm on the board, is a business in transition from a traditional letters business to an e-commerce parcel delivery business. And automation and AI are playing a key part in that transition enabling the organisation to increase volumes of parcels, to improve safety by reducing manual handling, and to enhance the customer experience by giving more information about where your parcels are. And this is actually about creating new and sustainable jobs rather than replacing jobs. Uh, and if we can show that uh, infographic, for which I thank Diane Smith-Gander and uh, McKinsey, a few years ago, all we were hearing about was the percentage of jobs that were going to be displaced by automation and AI. Um, but more recently, we've started to hear about the new jobs that are going to be created. And this is just some modelling that uh, McKinsey have done for Australia. Maybe three and a half million jobs are going to disappear, but, or change considerably, but 4.1 new jobs uh, could potentially be created. So that really brings into focus the role and responsibility of uh, employers, of government in ongoing training and uh, upskilling of people, and also for all of us a, a, a thought about um, what inequalities that may uh, give rise to in the, in the workplace. These changes are already happening, so this is a very important and timely discussion. I'm going to start off with a few questions for our panel. Uh, and uh, then I'll, I'll call on you to uh, pose your questions. So I'm going to start with Guy Herbert, who, who is a risk futurist at Atlassian. I'm going to ask you about whether the fears of AI and automation are justified or whether actually there's more risk in not uh, understanding and implementing uh, these opportunities uh, in the future. Uh, look, I'd, I, I actually think that there is, there is risk associated with the transition. Uh, when, I, when I sort of think about the future, we sort, of, we sort of have this view of there's either I'm the pet of the robot overlords uh, or I've got unlimited leisure time. And I don't know about you, but I feel as though I don't have unlimited leisure time and it's not getting any better. Uh, so I, I think about, okay, well, what's, what's this going to look like within our organisation? And I'm seeing that, that people are, are needing to collaborate more and it's about being adaptable to our environment. And so helping, helping the machines be able to make the right decisions is one of the things that we need to do. But we also need to go, all right, how's that impacting on the people? What are the things that the people need to do? And you know, if we, if we look at the things that, the work that people have traditionally done, it's about, okay, well, I do, some, I do some thinking work and then I get some downtime in between the thinking work. And I think what we're seeing now is that we're asking people to think more and there's less downtime in between that thinking. And so that actually places more of a cognitive load on our people. And yet we all like to believe that we're great at thinking and we can just think all the time. But actually, you know, you, you look at the way that you think, it tends to be up and down. And so if you're now asking people to be you know, aware and cognitive all the time, there's a cognitive load on people and it makes it actually quite difficult for, for people. 
the, the risk associated with not doing this is that your organisation becomes further and further behind everybody else. And I think that's the biggest risk to most organisations. You know, when we, when we think about what I want when I'm dealing with an organisation, uh, I want them to solve my problem. Uh, I don't want them to do that in a really efficient way. Uh, I want them to be really effective in how they deal with me. And so we need to be able to have the machines that support that, but then the interaction that I have, it's usually with a person. And the effective outcome tends to be driven by a person. Yeah, they were supported by the machine, but it's the effective outcome I'm looking for. So we really all need to work on understanding um, what this uh, new technology is and how it can actually support our strategic goals. Nigel uh, Amphalor, if perhaps I can turn to you as the, the chair of the board of CUA, you've been um, investing heavily in the digital transformation. Can you talk to us a little bit about the journey that you and your board have been on in terms of building AI and um, uh, and learning uh, uh, data analytics into your str your strategy and how you've actually uh, gone about educating yourselves. Thanks, Deirdre. Uh, let me just start off by saying that I'm going to approach this from a board point of view, uh, rather than you know the people who get in and do all the uh, algorithm creations and stuff like that. I'll also uh, preface it by saying that. There's no right or wrong answer at this stage. We're all on a journey and we're learning. And quite frankly, in a year's time, we might look back and sort of say, gee, we could have done that differently or should have done it better. So with, with those caveats, I'll just give you some brief background as to you know, wh why it's CUA and where we're up to. Uh, we, we do pretty regular horizon scanning of you know, the di uh, what's happening in, the, in uh, digital and intentions economy and stuff like that. And when people started talking to us about uh, neural networks and deep learning, artificial intelligence, we soon realized as a board that there's this tsunami of technology that's approaching us and we weren't sure we were properly prepared for it. So we had to start thinking about, okay, what do we want to do and what should our role as a board be in a you know, journey of uh, robotics and AI? And we, we decided that uh, there were two or three things. One is we needed to understand the impact it had on our business. And the second, we needed to make sure we were able to ask the right questions rather than provide the answers. So it's the old thing, you start off with education. We ran some sessions. The very first one was uh, uh, AI 101. What is it? Yeah, difference between analytics uh, robotic process automation, AI, deep learning, and things like that, just as set the scene. Uh, then the next one was, let's just dive a little bit deeper into AI, and one of the things a lot of people talk about is unconscious bias. Now, when we do our day-to-day -day job, we never really think about unconscious bias. So we ran, uh, got someone to ran a, run a session for the board on discovering what your own unconscious biases were. And uh, the reason this was important was the penny dropped with all the board members and said, God, you know, if, if algorithms are developed that contain unconscious bias, the moral hazards are quite enormous and you can create some enormous systemic risk. So that started opening up a whole other series of questions. Then the third session is, uh, which a subcommittee seen and the board will see in a couple of weeks, is around what is CUA's uh, robotic and AI journey from now to uh, where we want to get to. So basically, that's the education process we've done. The future sessions are planned around impact on workforce and impact on governance and risk frameworks. Uh, so that learning was to just try and get the board more aware that something ha is happening and you've got to be part of it. Now, the, uh, the, the, the key lessons that we learned from this is that you've really got to have accountability within the organization for somebody that's going to take ownership and responsibility of this. Uh, we also discovered that it's, it's not something you can put in technology. It's actually a whole of business issue. It impacts every part of your business. So whilst you might have somebody who's accountable for it, 
and more often that than not, that is a uh, technology person. The CEO has got to take real ownership of this and make sure the resources from the different parts of the business are pulled in. The, the other thing we also realized was that the journey is not a strategy, uh, but it can impact how you deliver your strategy and how fast you can deliver your strategy. So it's quite important to align the digital journey with your strategy. And the last thing we learned was you can't just do your digital journey on its own. You've actually got to do that in conjunction with the impact on your workforce as well as the governance around it. And if you think people have worked in the governance and risk area over here, if you think back, uh, quite often technology is just raced off and you've done things with it and then everyone plays catch up in terms of resources and risk and governance. Uh, it's just that with AI and robotics, it's gonna, if, you, if you're not careful, there it could be so opaque down the line that trying to get on top of what the risk issues are could be quite enormous. So those are the kind of issues and lessons we learned initially mm -hmm. and how we started our journey. Thank you very much. And I think um, what's really coming through here is, is the impact on people. Mm. And we'll come back a little bit to the new, the new skills. But um, I think it's a great opportunity to ask um, Taj Babari, who is um, our youngest presenter at this conference. I think you're 20 this month. Yeah, I've got a week until I turn 20. So <laughs> yeah, I'm still 19 for, for another week. So, yeah. um, so you um, uh, ha have been, um, you set up your first business, I think when you were 11 and uh, you have founded um, 56 Creations, which, and you've educated 60,000 school children already uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and the skills that they need for the future. And I think the really important thing is you're not really focusing on um, uh, programming and coding and IT skills. You're actually uh, uh, focusing on the people skills mm. that they will need. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how, <coughs> what you see the challenges are for young people entering the workforce in the next five, 10 or even 20 years? Yeah, absolutely. I think, like for me, when I started my career, I was pretty horrific in the classroom. Uh, I was suspended about four times by grade four, and I think by around grade five, mum and dad were like, so mum followed a very traditional pathway in the sense she was brought up in the UK, clearly an Indian background, so for them, they were like, we've moved to Australia, we've sent you to a good school, we kind of want you to be a doctor or be a lawyer or something that fits university into the picture. And I think for me, it, it <coughs> didn't excite me. I sat in the classroom and I was just, I always wanted to do something new uh, and for me, got involved in business quite young and decided this makes me excited. I love it, I enjoy it, um, and this is what I want to do when I grow up. And so at the age of 13, I started teaching kids how to code. Um, the former communications minister and then became prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull, was on this big coding agenda. If your child doesn't know how to code, they will be left behind. And 13-year-old me thought, well, if Malcolm Turnbull's saying it, then we have to teach kids how to code. And we created this do-it-yourself tablet for kids where we'd actually give kids the opportunity to design their own tablet computer from scratch. And like, I wanted one, so that's why I created the idea of this tablet. And um, it was a cool idea. And uh, unfortunately, we, never, we sold 25,000 units. We had to refund them after two years. Didn't teach any kids how to code, but then realized, you know what? These skills that we've learned building this device are incredible. We've taught, I've, well, personally, as a result of actually founding an organization, I've learned about communication, I've learned about people skills, I've learned how to talk, I've learned how to negotiate with Chinese manufacturers, I've learned about conflict resolution with customers who had ordered this tablet for their 16 year old, the child had turned 18, moved out of home, and they'd still not received this device. And I just thought business teaches you a whole set of diverse skills that are obviously fundamental for the future of work. Uh, for us, we believe the future of work is gonna be a world where human skills are the skills of the future. Uh, it's a skill that's been around in every single generation. Every single generation has had to communicate. If you wanna get a good job, you've gotta obviously impress in your job interview. But we think for young people in this current generation, uh, basic communication is the most important skill they can learn. Can these young people public speak? Can these young people hold a conversation? Uh, can they get up into an interview and, and interact and show them what their skills are without even looking at that CV? What, why should I employ you? Uh, and unfortunately at school, I just finished school two years ago, and, or three years ago, uh, and 
in school when we did orals or English presentations, uh, we were told, well, if you want to succeed in this English presentation, you have to have a good uh, starter, you have to have a good body, you have to explain your problem solution, uh, and then say it loudly, read off your script and you'll be okay. Or if you want to get an even better grade, memorize it. Uh, that's not what the future of work looks like. It's impromptu speaking, it's being able to adapt. Uh, Guy said that earlier, you've got to have an adaptable skill set, and that's something that we think uh, is really important as we enter that, that workforce of the future. Um, so it's an exciting, an exciting, exciting generation. Hmm. I think that's actually a really good point because one of the things you were talking about, like, you know, you, you talk about, okay, I had to learn all these skills mm. and I had to learn to deal with the Chinese manufacturers and I had to negotiate and I had to think about these things and it wasn't about actually I need to follow the formula, it was like actually I need to adapt and being able to take that situation and learn from it and then respond and go, okay, well, what's the next iteration of this thing is actually what made it successful. Absolutely, learning on the job. Like, yeah, yeah. seriously, I had no, for and I, I'm a huge fan of formal education, a massive fan of universities, but I think over the course of my career, being able to do the formal education part, then literally go and apply it the day after um, has been special, and I think that's what probably a very mainstream education will look like uh, for young people, our Gen Zs and, and, and the young kids today. That's what their formal education will look like. So, um, Guy, um, Atlassian builds software which empowers teams. Um, and I don't um, think that's one of the things where you sort of like, one of the things I was going to talk about there was like, you didn't do that, do that by yourself. You did that with a team of people. Absolutely. And it's about, it's, it's collaboration. And I think that's, so from, from our perspective, so Atlassian makes tools to help teams collaborate. But one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, if I just give you a tool, then it's a fool with a tool. And what I actually need is I need teams to understand the practices. And that's now what we are sharing is, and our customers want us to share what are our internal practices that make us successful so that we can emulate that. So what are the things that we do? And for us, that's about, you know, we, we, we do collaboration. How do I get teams to collaborate better? How do I get people in the room to be able to share the information? And you know, when I think about, okay, well, what's the, what's the skills that people need in the future? It's, it's collaboration, it's connection, it's cognitive thinking, it's critical thinking, it's analyzing. And so if I do, do all of those things, but I can't do those in isolation. I actually need to do that with a group of people. And you know, we, we've often sort of talk about like, okay, well this younger generation is gonna be more adaptable than the older generation, but for me it's about what's the mindset that goes with that? How do I get people to think that actually I need to adapt? How do I, how do I take that information and be able to respond to it? Nigel, perhaps if we can come back to you and if you can talk a little bit about um, how you've brought together a team from across CUA to work on this and, and what sort of people across the organisation um, are, are in that team and for this audience what the role of uh, the, the company secretary or the, um, the risk governance professionals has been or is mm. likely to be. I'll start off with the last part of your question first because I think it's really important and I think this is where the company secretary can play an enormously helpful role by guiding the chair, as you know, as ours did. She was very, very helpful. Uh, right at the start, I think it's fairly important for the board to enunciate its position on AI. You know, what's its purpose? So for us, we've sort of said this is this is not about cost reduction. It's not about taking heads out. It's about something else. You know, so we want to we want to use AI to reinforce and do better in terms of the human interface with our customers and the trust factor. We don't want, we don't want to disintermediate our customers from our people. And the second a purpose we sort of thought about as well was our workforce. You know, we've got to treat them with dignity and respect. And to be able to do that, you've got to start two years in advance to work out what exactly the impacts were. So. If you, if you look at those as being your purpose as to why you want to use AI, AI then it's very obvious that your head of people and culture or your you know, chief uh, people person 
has got to work very closely with whoever's ch charged with the responsibility for uh, you know, the, the digital journey. The other thing that I think the board's got to enunciate right up front is the ethical standards. I'm not going to go through them because Microsoft have some. I think Data61 has a, you know, some ethical guidelines that are pretty useful. So, so you, can, uh, you, know, you can adopt those. They're out there in the marketplace, and we've adopted one of those. Another area that we haven't quite come to grips with, and there's been quite a bit of writing on this, is how you use this for social good, for promoting prosperity. And uh, I'll be brutally honest with you, we haven't <laughs> worked out how to do that yet, but it's something in the back of our mind because we are a mutual, we are owned by our members, and we know we've got a, an obligation to feed back into the community. So that's the principles there. I'll just move on into governance and risk management. I mean, my view is that your, your current governance and risk management frameworks as a whole should address the majority of issues and risks arising from AI, but they do need to be adapted. And, I, and I've come up with a couple of areas where I think you, you know, boards need to think about uh, where they need to focus on. The first is uh, risk appetite. <coughs> Historically, a lot of these sort of uh, RPA activities of not quite skunk works, but they're small, they're fast fail systems, they try, you know, learn as you go experiments. And quite often, boards don't get visibility of that. You know, that's down in the, in the bowels of the beast. The board gets vis visibility of the core systems replacements. So you've got to fine tune your risk appetite to sort of say, what visibility does the board need? It's not dissimilar to, you know, uh, the, uh, the prelude to the Royal Commission and financial services where culture and conduct was a big issue. You know, quite often that was lost in a risk appetite statement. Now it's front and center as a risk class. Similar concept. Uh, the other area is, uh, uh, do boards actually understand what the algorithms are, algorithms are basically trying to do? You need some knowledge of it. You need to understand uh, what the potential unintended consequences of these are. Now, you don't need to know how to actually make algorithms, but you actually need to understand what you're trying to achieve. And I'll, gi I'll give you a very good example of that before I go on. One of the things we've been talking about is uh, credit assessments. You know, when you apply for a loan, uh, there's the traditional way of doing it, and somebody came up with a concept of propensity to default. You can actually use AI to examine how a person behaves, operates, their transactions, to predict their propensity to default from a loan. To, f now, that is great when you're talking about an individual, because it's everything you're looking at is customized and belongs to that individual. But the next step is, well, if I've got an algorithm that works for Fred, can I apply that same algorithm for John or Mary? And this is where you get into a moral hazard. You know, this is where you sort of uh, start uh, you're creating opaqueness around what you're doing. So you've got to be careful, you've got to understand what, what you're trying to achieve over there. Uh, the other thing we realized is we really want to make sure the humans are still in control, okay? Mm. So you've got to have very good feedback systems. Now, a lot of boards now get feedback and customer complaints and things like that, but that's down the line. We sort of said, no, uh, management, you come back with feedback systems up front that tell us that humans are actually looking at what the results are and validating it, saying, yes, it, it's operating as expected, and do it so that the person who created the algorithm with a potential bias is not the one that's confirming the bias. Uh, the last bit is uh, privacy and security. Now, this takes on an entirely new complexion because you're not only looking at raw data about individuals, you're looking at insights you're looking at uh, predictions of what people are going to do, what their behavior is going to be. And it's starting to get much, much more personal than just financial type, type data. So those are some of the risk management and governance issues that we're starting to focus on. Have we got the answers? No, but I think we're starting to ask the right questions. Uh, and then the other bit is workforce, okay? As I said, we want to treat them with dignity and respect. So we've actually already started mapping all our, the jobs at CUA to identify which ones of those are going to be impacted by AI and robotics and the extent to which they're going to be impacted. And then we're going to start looking at 
you know, which employees are impacted, how you retrain them, what new skills you need, and things like that. Mm, thank you. If anybody has any questions, um, please either send them through <coughs> or, um, or pop your hand up. Um, Taj, young people, I think history tells us young people are incredibly confident and, and resourceful mm. uh, and have a habit of just getting on with things. In your experience, how concerned are young people about the changes that are being talked about and, or are they just getting on with it? Well, Australia has always been known as a highly innovative country. <coughs> and the question that I think has really challenged us is that because of or in spite of our education system and in particular our schooling system. And over the last couple of years, that's something that we've been really fascinated with and that's why we go into classrooms uh, and it's not the teacher's fault. It's, they don't have time, they don't have the creativity to teach the skills that young people will need in that ever-changing workforce of the future. So when we go into the classroom, we teach kids how to start a business. Um, business teaches you how to adapt and it teaches you transferable and timeless skills. I think young people are certainly worried about the skills they're learning, but I think they'll be okay. Uh, this generation is highly adaptable. Uh, millennials, we thought they were hard in the workforce. They change jobs every 12, 12 to 18 months. That kind of means they have to be quite adaptable human beings to do that. They're able to upskill, they're able to retrain, they're able to try new things. And I think that provides a strong hope for Gen Z. Uh, it's gonna be tougher for you guys. How do you retain these amazing people, some of them, but how do you, how do you actually retain the, the incredible ones? And I think that's gonna have to be an interesting shift for our more traditional organizations um, because they are important. Um, how do we get young people learning, I think, skills? For me, I think the, the four C's uh, of soft skills, number one is communication, number two is collaboration, uh, number three is communication. Number four is critical thinking. Um, these are the four skills that every single young person must know to be prepared for that workforce of the future. Uh, and it's something that, sure, they might not be trained for it right now, but they'll be okay. It's interesting because I was sort of, you know, we were talking earlier in the, in the speaker room and I was sort of like, actually, I think that's less about a generational thing and it's more about a person, like each individual person. Now, I don't know if anybody's looked through my bio, but at one stage I was sort of changing jobs every 12 months. So my wife was worried I couldn't keep a job. Uh, but one of the things, it's, it, that was me, and I'm uh, definitely not a millennial. And, and so it's, it's not about, for me it's a generation is not about whether you change and whether you adapt and whether you're able to deal with this. It's about where's, what's your starting point. And so we say, you know, these, the, the people coming out now are digital natives mm. and, you know, I wasn't a digital native, but I dealt with change. And so I think that being able to support all of the different types of people in the organisation is really important. One of the things that Nigel was talking about was like, okay, well, we're going to get all of these people and we're going to have this strategy and we're going to deal with like, okay, what are all the jobs that are going to be impacted? In your organisation, is that something that you would share now or would you share that at the end of the towards the end of the journey because in our organization we would share that now You're right. i think oh, sorry sorry if you don't mind yeah I, I think you need to share it now because one of the things i believe you've got to do is actually take your people on the journey with yes. you not surprise them at the end and just you know, expanding on your digital natives i mean i got chastised for saying this but i sort of said we need to know who our digital natives are uh, the digital migrants and the digital refugees. People didn't like the digital refugees bit, so I've got to find another word for that. But, but uh, Nigel, look who's, he's using paper. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know. Look at him. <laughs> and I'm I, supposed to be Gen Z, the, yeah. the digital savvy, and I'm using and I didn't get the note about the no tie and the shorts and the suit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you, Nigel, continue, please. <laughs> but, but you have to take people on the journey and, yes. and get them to understand that we're going to treat you with dignity and respect. We're going to try and reskill as many of you as possible for roles of the future. And that's what we're doing now. And you're going to come on this journey with us. And you've got to be honest that say, inevitably there are some people that won't fit into the future operating model. Yes. But we, we will try and help you do something else. Uh, you've got to take the fear out of it and get people to start working with AI and robotics, not against it. 
We had a little bit of a discussion here yesterday afternoon about um, board composition and there was um, a, a slight difference of opinion about whether we actually need people who have more of uh, an IT or data science background uh, on our boards. And I'd just be interested in, in your comments. We, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but uh, perhaps starting with you, Nigel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, I'll start off by saying you need a very diverse board, and particularly in terms of thought and the way in which they approach uh, discussions. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about, you know, the ideal board environment, but one of the things you've got to be cautious of when you get people on the board is that they're not, they're, you know, they're so deep into what they do that they don't take you down rabbit holes all the time. And this was uh, an issue that we were very concerned with. So we tried a variant to that, and we have subcommittees, like, a, like an innovation subcommittee, that the board's on, and this is just to prove to everyone in our workforce that the board is really serious about this. So we've, we're trialing getting uh, advisors to sit on those subcommittees, because then you know, you've got a lot more flexibility with what you do, how you get them involved, and how long you need them for. But they are exceptionally useful because they help the board ask the right questions. Thank you. And um, Guy, you, yeah, you work I, with teams. Yeah, we, we, we were working about uh, talking about this earlier, and, and one of the things we talked about was like, yes, you need to have a diverse board, but it needs to be that cognitive diversity. Mm. And I think the other thing that we often, uh, that we see particularly in our organisation is this concept of, okay, my tenure gives me r right to say things in a meeting and that people need to listen to me, whereas actually what I need to do is go into a meeting and I need to shut up and listen because my, if I'm you know, the smartest person in the room, I need to be in a better room. I need to actually find people who have <laughs> you know, better ideas than what I've got. <coughs> and, and that to me, you know, I, I remember working at Macquarie um, and I was in the internal audit group and I was like, yeah, I know the answer. And then one of my team was just like, that is such crap. And I thought, actually, you're right. And because that person challenged me and because I listened, uh, we actually came up with a much better solution. And I think that's where we need to have that, that diversity of thinking, but we also need to make sure that people are uh, inclusive within those meetings, so they're actually pulling the ideas out, and that when people put forward an idea, we actually respect that. And I think the idea of young people sitting on boards is something that I've been quite new to. As soon as I turned 18, uh, I had a heap of invitations from my state government saying, hey, you should join this. And I think that was quite a fascinating process for someone who just turned 18. Uh, so I quickly did, uh, I did a Governance in Institute course. I did an AICD uh, course. And I just thought this was fascinating. So we started actually getting some of our excellent young people, the most excellent creative minds. Uh, and we started inviting them to sit on corporate boards. Uh, and as we did that, it was fascinating, this idea of reverse mentoring. Uh, young people are going to be inheriting all of your companies. My generation will be sitting on your boards uh, in the very near future. We're going to be dealing with the challenges of the future. We're going to be dealing with climate change. We're, going to, we're currently being trained in jobs that will no longer exist in the future. So if there's going to be any generation that's going to be solving your problems, it's going to be us. And I think including young people uh, on these boards has been fascinating. And some of the feedback we've had, some of the diversity of thought of young people sitting on this board uh, has been magical and something that we really advocate for because we really are going to be inheriting a lot of these, a lot of these challenges. Oh, thank you. Uh, just turning now to, uh, to the people piece, um, and if we uh, look at some of the research, it says that the average person by 2040 will have changed not just jobs but occupation um, at least once and, and many uh, multiple times. Um, so. Uh, and one, um, one think tank suggests that we're going to all have to um, have a third more education throughout our lives, which is, equates to an extra three hours per week um, for our whole career. So if we've got this constant need for reskilling and upskilling and education and training, where does the responsibility for that lie between the individual, the employer and the government? Um, Guy. Uh, okay, so. I think that the organisation has a responsibility to provide training for the people that they're looking to transition. I think that that's really important that they see that as, okay, we're going to move these people, like you know, Nigel was talking about, like 
these, these people are going to move. Okay, well, how are we going to help them? What's the education we need to give them? So that's within the organisation. I then think that our adult education system is probably not set up to help us. And so we need to do work with that. You know, I, I sort of look at, you know, what are the adult education courses out there? And a lot of it is about, you know, how pottery, painting, you know, it's, it's, it's the creative stuff that people want to do as, as, as a side learning thing. It's not about how do I transform my, you know, my personal education. Uh, and, but, but I think that to say actually it's the organisation and the, the government's, you know, gov government's responsibility really takes ownership away from the individual. And I think that people need to s take responsibility for their own education. And being a, look, I'm a, a lifelong education person. You know, when we talk about like, you know, the number of changes that, you know, one job change, my gosh, I've had like, <laughs> I hate to, li I've lost count. Different careers, I've done all sorts of stuff. Uh, but that was because I was interested. And I think that if we go, you know, what's, what's the thing that interests the people, then that's going to take them in the right place. You know, looking at, there's some people who are going to transition out of the organisation because that's the right result for them. Helping them work out what they should be doing is, you know, what we should do as an organisation. But that takes individual responsibility. So, so, so I sort of see it as three levels and all of them have a component there. Mm. Taz? Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, obviously the individual themselves and from a younger age, parents. Uh, Schools have a lot to deal with. Uh, teachers have a lot to deal with. Um, I th in my opinion, parents need to step in yeah. uh, and introduce them if w there's a, clearly we've got a financial uh, literacy crisis amongst young people. Um, growing up, my parents never gave me pocket money. So from a very young age, in order for me to experiment with the new phones or try that new device, I had to find a way to do it. Um, so at the age of 11, I was applying for jobs. Now, obviously, I couldn't get a casual job at the age of 11, so I started a business. And that was because my parents thought the best way of teaching their child about financial literacy was to just try to let them go, and as long as it wasn't anything illegal, no worries. Um, <laughs> and Define illegal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a gray area, but um, I think growing well, up, that's the course. only reason uh, I was able to understand numbers and understand that if I wanted something, I actually had to start a business and go and do it. So I got pushed into entrepreneurship in a very lopsided fashion. But I think parents carry a huge responsibility, and I think they sh uh, more than, I think, in that early years up to the age of 18, I think parents are probably the biggest influence uh, for, those, for those years. Thank you. Now, we don't have long to go, and I now have two questions. So we'll start at the, at the back there. Can we turn the mic on and... Hello? Is it on? Yeah? Hi. Um, Ainsley Cunningham. I'm risk manager and assistant company secretary in a financial services company. And um, this is probably a question for all four of you and how you see where the future of risk management is heading um, as if you look at risk management as being sort of a, a train on a track and that as the organisation has set the objectives and the goals for the business as their destination and the board is responsible for uh, reviewing and approving strategy, operational plans, budgets, etc., as being the track and the train is actually being driven by the CEO and the board has that helicopter view over it. Where now do you we're see right out of time, so I might just pass straight to Guy for a quick, very oh, quick okay. answer. Um, so for me, everybody tells you risk management, get involved earlier in the process. Uh, but for me, it's like, okay, well, what do I do when I'm earlier in the process? And so the things that I've done is tried to work out, okay, well, what's the, what's the change that's coming? How do I get the best result out of that change? Uh, how do I make sure that we're thinking about the right questions? Uh, and then saying for, for the organisation, I want us to be effective. So how do I get involved in that process so that I am more effective at being able to manage the risk? Does so that answer been, the question? We've been gifted an extra 10 minutes, so if you, if you wanted to add to that <laughs> question. 
No, that's okay. I'll let someone else go. Fantastic. Did, um, if I didn't answer the question, grab me afterwards and we can have a chat. Nigel? No, I, I, the, the only little bit I'll add to that is I think uh, it's like when, you know, computers first came along, you had to have risk management people that were specialists in that area to understand the mechanics. I think you're going to have to, the, the education and training and skill sets of rich risk management pre professionals will need to evolve. But I think it is a discipline that is here to stay and be of growing importance. Yeah, I, I'd also add into that that we often do a lot of risk management busy work. And so it's, you know, the sort of the generation of the reports, we're following up on lots of stuff, but we're not really being effective. And so actually thinking about what, you know, what's the implications of the things that the organisation are doing is really important. So step back and think. So we've got some questions coming through on the board now. A really interesting one from Daryl Sumners. What advice do you have for someone encountering a lot of resistance to introducing automation to a business area that has been automated by competitors for years, uh, where generation gap between board and coalface seems to be a contributing factor? Who'd like to take that one on? <laughs> well, I think young people, having young people on a board is a, this is why we have young people on a board, I think. To kind of bridge that gap, they are native, like, even though you, <laughs> sorry. Uh, even though I think young people are obviously born into the digital economy, we're born into the world of automation. Uh, young people, you, everyone knows you walk into a restaurant and kids have iPads. I think uh, by having young people on a board, this is not just sudden, this is, a, this is a journey. And I think as soon as you put a young person, this is something they'll understand. And I think uh, this is a clear reason why we need to have young, pers young people on every single corporate board. Uh to me, to me, the you know, a key part of this is education of the board and understanding how this is going to impact their business and you know, in terms of their responsibility to their stakeholders. And most board members, if you put it in that context, they'll say, okay, I've got, a, I've got an obligation to do the right thing, so uh, let's do it. A lot of the resistance comes through a lack of knowledge and understanding. Is it perhaps that people aren't perhaps evaluating the right risks? Yeah, this is people not, you know, they, you sort of look at the Kodak case studies. Kodak had all the ability to do, you know, digital photography. They just didn't see it as, you know, their business. And so to me, this is a question about the board not really understanding, you know, okay, there's change required. How are we going to be the best business for the future? 